I included a poll at the end of my last video to decide the topic for the discussion group for this coming week, and the topic that won out was Plato's argument for God, which many people may not be familiar with. Uh, there are a couple arguments, really, one in the Republic having to do with the nature of beauty, which is essentially an argument from the existence of the forms, which might be likened to an argument from the existence of mathematical order as well, although the analogy there is not immediately obvious. And then what we'll be looking at today is the argument from Book 10 of the Laws. The reason the Athenian in the dialogue brings forward this argument is that it's necessary that uh, people believe in the gods in order that they should try to follow the laws all the time and not just when uh, they can't get away with breaking them. So to have someone be truly just, they have to believe that there is a cosmic justice and not just man's justice, which seems fairly straightforward. And uh, he says basically that people don't follow the laws when they can get away with it, either because they believe the gods don't exist, they don't care about humans, or they do care about humans but are easily placated. So he goes and addresses all of these positions. We're just going to look at the existence of God in the first place. Um, and really the argument set forward here is, in essence, the argument for the unmoved mover that's found in Aristotle. Aristotle's formulation is more famous, but it originates with Plato, and really the Western tradition of natural theology uh, is inaugurated by Plato in this argument. So it is of significant historical value, which is why I think it's worth it to go ahead and read the entire passage. It's going to take a while, um, and you can always skip past where I read it if I want to give a little analysis. I might stop in the middle of it as well. Um, but if you want to participate in the discussion group this week uh, or show up for the group chat next Saturday at 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, you can just read the relevant passage yourself. Um, you can find this book, obviously, for free online. Um, it's book 10. You could just read all of book 10 from the laws uh, and you'll basic basically be up to speed. But yeah, if you do want to participate in the discussion, click on the link for peeracademy.net in the description, create an account, email me, my username there is Erval, just like it's spelled in the YouTube channel, tell me you want to be part of the group, and every Sunday thereafter you will receive a list of discussion pairs, and so you'll know who your discussion partner for that week is, it's up to you to schedule a time to speak with them. And then, as I said, we have the weekly group chat. Usually it's Saturday at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. This week it'll be 9 next Saturday. And so we'll be talking about Plato's argument from the laws uh, for God. Now, if you're not familiar with Plato, it's important not to take anything that is said in the dialogues at face value. Plato says in his surviving letters, uh, especially the seventh letter, that he never puts his true doctrines in the dialogues. The dialogues are meant for public consumption, so they're basically pedagogical tools, which is why they take the form of dialogues. Um, and Aristotle also backs up the notion that Plato did have secret teachings that were not public. Remember, Plato ran a school that was very selective and he had no reason to try to lay out his system formally in the way that Aristotle lays his out. He could work with students directly and his philosophy was that he doesn't teach students who don't also at the same time alter their conduct in other areas of life. So it's not strictly academic in the academy, it's also a matter of lifestyle and morality. But it has also recently been confirmed what was long thought that there is, in fact, a mathematical structure to the dialogues which encodes some aspect of this hidden teaching. Um, J.B. Kennedy's book, The Musical Structure of Plato's Dialogues, would be something to look at, um, and it does reveal the Pythagorean link uh, besides the evidence that we have from Plato's letters themselves and certain references in the dialogue. Um, so... <laughs> Yeah, Plato argues for God 
basically in a way that modern uh, mathematical Platonists would, you need the idea of something like a personal god or a, a god that has uh, a soul in the sense that animals have a soul in order to account for the rational order of the universe. But anyway, we'll look at this, the argument that appears here. It might take a little bit, um, but let's get started. And I could start further down, but I really do want to start up here so that we can look at how Plato addresses the argument or position of the atheist, because it's very similar to how I've been addressing the Nietzscheans in our communities recently. And really, Nietzsche could have just been Thrasymachus, like from the Republic. There's little difference in his actual position, and you'll see that in Plato's characterization through the character of the Athenian here. Okay, so... In the first place, my dear friend, these people would say that the gods exist not by nature, but by art, and by the laws of states, which are different in different places, according to the agreement of those who make them, and that the honorable is one thing by nature, and another thing by law. So this is like the Nietzschean idea that there is biological quality, there are higher types, and then there are lower types, and then conventionally, there is the slave morality of the good man and the evil man. And these are two fundamentally different value systems. This stuff was addressed in antiquity. And a lot of the problem with the Nietzscheans is that they never reconciled with Plato and they kind of dismissed Plato without understanding him. Um, you have to understand Plato if you want to understand philosophy. And that the principles of justice have no existence at all in nature, but that mankind are always disputing about them and altering them. So uh, no natural rights is what he's saying, the atheist believes. And that the alterations which are made by art and by law have no basis in nature, but are of authority for the moment and at that time at which they are made. These, my friends, are the sayings of wise men, he means sophists, poets, and prose writers which find a way into the minds of youth. They are told by them that the highest right is might, and in this way the young fall into impieties, under the idea that the gods are not such as the law bids them imagine, and hence arise factions, these philosophers inviting them to lead a true life according to nature, that is, to live in real dominion over others and not in legal subjection to them. Uh, it's just Nietzscheanism, anticipated. Clinius, what a dreadful picture, stranger, have you given, and how great is the injury which is thus inflicted on young men to the ruin both of states and families? Athenian, true, Clinius, but then what should the lawgiver do when this evil is of long standing? Should he only rise up in the state and threaten all mankind, proclaiming that if they will not say and think that the gods are such as the law ordains, and this may be extended generally to the honorable, the just, and to all the highest things, and to all that relates to virtue and vice. And if they will not make their actions conform to the copy which the law gives them, then he who refuses to obey the law shall die, or suffer stripes and bonds, or privation of citizenship, or in some cases puni be punished by loss of property and exile. Should he not, rather, when he is making laws for men, at the same time infuse the spirit of persuasion into his words, and mitigate the severity of them as far as he can? Clinius. Why stranger? And also, this book, in general, is important for the history of law, obviously. Um, Clinius. Why stranger? It influenced a lot of the Roman lawmakers and such. Clinius. Why, stranger, if such persuasion be at all possible, then a legislator who has anything in him ought never to weary of persuading men. He ought to leave nothing unsaid in support of the ancient opinion that there are gods, and of all those other truths which you were just now mentioning. He ought to support the law and also art, and acknowledge that both alike exist by nature, and no less than nature, if they are the creations of mind in accordance with right reason as you appear to me to maintain, and I am disposed to agree with you in thinking. Athenian, yes, my enthusiastic Clinius, but are not these things when spoken to a multitude hard to be understood, not to mention that they take up a dismal length of time? Clinius, 
Why, stranger, shall we, whose patience failed not when drinking or music was, were the themes of discourse, weary now of discoursing about the gods and about divine things? And the greatest help to rational legislation is that the laws, when once written down, are always at rest. They can be put to the test at any future time, and therefore, if on first hearing they seem difficult, there is no reason for apprehension about them, because any man, however dull, can go over them and consider them again and again. Nor if they are tedious, but useful, is there any reason or religion, as it seems to me, in any man refusing to maintain the principles of them to the utmost of his power. Megillus. Stranger, I like what Clinius is saying. Athenian. Yes, Megillus, and we should do as he proposes, for if impious discourses were not scattered, as I may say, throughout the world, there would have been no need for any vindication of the existence of the gods. But seeing that they are spread far and wide, such arguments are needed. And who should come to the rescue of the greatest laws, when they are being undermined by bad men, but the legislator himself? Megillus, there is no more proper champion of them. Athenian, well then tell me, Clinius, for I must ask you to be my partner. Does not he who talks in this way conceive fire and water and earth and air to be the first elements of all things? These he calls nature, and out of these he supposes the soul to be formed afterwards. And this is not a mere conjecture of ours but about his meaning, but is what he really thinks. Clinius, very true. Athenian, then by heaven we have discovered the source of this vain opinion of all those physical investigators, and I would have you examine their arguments with the utmost care, for their impiety is a very serious matter. They not only make a bad and mistaken use of argument, but they lead away the minds of others. That is my opinion of them. Cleinias, you are right, but I should like to know how this happens. Athenian, I fear that the argument may seem singular. Uh, he's basically saying, like, it, things are about to get weird, you might not understand what I'm going to talk about, and I very much sympathize with Plato here. There is an anecdote that Plato once gave a public lecture on the nature of love, and uh, he got into deep metaphysics, and apparently everyone left, except for Aristotle himself, who reports the story. Um, Clinius, do not hesitate, stranger. I see that you are afraid of such a discussion carrying you beyond the limits of legislation. But if there be no other way of showing our agreement in the belief that there are gods, of whom the law is said now to approve, let us take this way, my good sir. Athenian, then I suppose that I must repeat the singular argument of those who manufacture the soul according to their own impious notions. They affirm that which is the first cause of the generation and destruction of all things to be not first, but last, and that which is last to be first. And hence they have fallen into error about the true nature of the gods. Clinius, still I do not understand you. Athenian, Near, nearly all of them, my friend, seem to be ignorant of the nature and power of the soul, especially in what relates to her origin. They do not know that she is among the first of things, and before all bodies, and is the chief author of their changes and transpositions. And if this is true, and if the soul is older than the body, must not the things which are of the soul's kindred be of necessity prior to those which appertain to the body? Clinius, certainly. Athenian, then thought and attention and mind and art and law will be prior to that which is hard and soft and heavy and light and the great and primitive works and actions will be works of art, they will be the first, and after them will come nature and works of nature, which, however, is a wrong term for men to apply to them. These will follow and will be under the govern, uh, government of art and mind. So there may seem to be an error here, a logical fallacy, in that uh, if it is the case that soul precedes body? Is it necessarily the case that all things associated with soul as we know them it, psychologically, I guess, in uh, at the everyday world of our experience are all of those things as well prior? It may be that the essence of soul is prior. This is basically a statement of idealism. Uh, and yet something like he says here, 
art and law and attention and thought, like these aspects of soul as we know them today, are they necessarily prior as well? Um, and here I think it's partly an issue of translation, um, but I wouldn't, this is one of those cases, don't take the argument that appears so literally. Plato is the inaugurator also of the argument for, uh, you know, the noble lie. <laughs> so, I mean, it's explicit that this argument is a for a pragmatic purpose of persuading people so that they obey the laws. Um, and so he, he often does this, and I think Plato was conscious of it in the dialogues themselves. Um, okay, so in the uh, in one of the letters, Plato talks about his method of like studying any one thing, and he breaks down the idea basically of signifier and signified and like how to understand the name of a thing. And so Plato was basically an early pioneer of linguistics. So he would understand the nature of this fallacy, which is basically a conflation of a senso lato meaning of a term or like one definition of a term with its other definitions or its more strict uh, elements or connotations. He does this all over the place and I'll let you kind of work out what you will in that regard. But so far what's being said is that soul is older than body and therefore uh, the the things of the world, natural properties, hardness, softness, the things that might is concerned with really are actually posterior to thought, attention, mind, art, and law. Cleinias, but why is the word nature wrong? And we can look at like, you know, there's obviously the fact that there must be mathematical law, there must be rationality in nature in order for the notion of softness, heaviness, light, you know, physical, brute physical properties for them to exist there must be something like plato's talking about these elements maybe not thought in the way that we think of thought um, but everything else and i will also just give up front this is uh, schopenhauer saw himself as completing plato's system and when uh, plato says that thought and attention mind and art are prior to these physical properties he's saying also later that desire uh, wishes like these sorts of things are prior. That's the same as play, as uh, Schopenhauer saying the world in itself is will, and the representations, the physical structure of the world arise out of uh, this will and aren't prior to it, as the kind of materialist naturalist would believe. And why does Plato have these ideas? Uh, I think because this was the Advaita Vedanta philosophy. And uh, the idea that the world arises out of desire, that's central to Hindu thinking and Buddhist thinking as well. Um, Cleinias, but why is the word nature wrong? Athenian, because those who use the term mean to say that nature is the first creative power. But if the soul turned out to be the primeval element and not fire or air, then in the truest sense and beyond other things, the soul may be said to exist by nature. And this would be true if you proved that the soul is older than the body, but not otherwise. Cleinias, you are quite right. Athenian, shall we then take this as the next point to which our attention should be directed? Cleinias, by all means. Athenian, let us be on our guard, lest this most deceptive argument with its youthful looks, beguiling us old men, give us the slip and make a laughing stock of us. Who knows, but we may be aiming at the greater and fail of attaining the lesser. Uh, suppose that we, ha we three have to pass a rapid river, and I, being the youngest of the three and experienced in rivers, take upon me the duty of making the attempt first by myself, leaving you in safety at the bank. I am to examine whether the river is passable by older men like yourselves, and if such appears to be the case, then I shall invite you to follow, and my experience will help to convey you across. But if the river is impassable by you, then there will have been no danger to anybody but myself. 
would not that seem to be a very fair proposal? I mean to say that the argument in prospect is likely to be too much for you, out of your depth and beyond your strength, and I should be afraid that the stream of my questions might create in you, who are not in the habit of answering, giddiness and confusion of mind, and hence a feeling of unpleasantness and unsuitableness might arise. I think, therefore, that I had better first ask the questions and then answer them myself, while you listen in safety. In that way, I can carry on the argument until I have completed the proof that the soul is prior to the body. Cleinias, excellent stranger, I hope that you will do as you propose. Athenian, come then, and if ever we are to call upon the gods, let us call upon them now in all seriousness to come to the demonstration of their own existence. And so holding fast to the rope which will venture upon the depths of the argument. When questions of this sort are asked of me, my safest answer would appear to be as follows. Someone says to me, O oh stranger, are all things at rest and, no rest and nothing in motion, or is the exact opposite of this true? Or are some things in motion and others at rest? This is the kind of Parmenidean Heraclitus division that Plato's philosophy was meant to reconcile. To this I shall reply that some things are in motion and others at rest, and do not think uh, and do not things which move in a place and are not the things which are at rest at rest in a place? So both things are in a place, certainly, and some move or rest in one place, and some in more places than one. You mean to say we shall rejoin that those things which rest at the center move in one place. He's talking about rotation. Just as the circumference goes round of globes which are said to be at rest. Yes. And we observe that in the revolution, the motion which carries round the larger and the lesser circle at the same time is proportionately distributed to greater and smaller and is greater and smaller in a certain proportion. Here is a wonder, which might be thought an impossibility, that the same motion should impart swiftness and slowness in due proportion to larger and lesser circles. Very true. And when you speak of bodies moving in many places, you seem to me to mean those which move from one place to another, and sometimes have one center of motion, and sometimes more than one because they turn upon their axis, and whenever they meet anything, if it be stationary, they are divided by it. But if they get in the midst between bodies, which are approaching and moving towards the same spot from opposite directions, they unite with them. I admit the truth of what you are saying. Also, when they unite, they grow, and when they are divided, they waste away. That is, supposing the constitution of each to remain, or if that fails, then there is a second reason of their dissolution. And when are all things created, and how? <clears throat> Clearly, they are created when the first principle receives increase and attains to the second dimension, and from this arrives at the one which is neighbor to this, and after reaching the third, becomes perceptible to sense. Everything which is thus changing and moving is in a process of generation. Only when at rest has it real existence, but when passing into another state, it is destroyed utterly. Have we not mentioned all motions? <clears throat> have we not mentioned all motions that there are, and comprehended them under their kinds, and numbered them, with the exception, my friends, of two? He's describing the different kinds of motion. Uh, motion. I don't know the Greek term here, but there are many kinds of motion, like transformation, generation. Uh, would be a kind of motion, like a plant growing would be a kind of motion for the Greeks. Uh, so he's describing like rotation, uh, r rotation around an axi axis that also moves. He's trying to get to <clears throat> a key kind of motion that must necessarily be prior to others. Cleinias, which are they? Athenian, just the two with which our present inquiry is concerned. Cleinias, speak plainer. Athenian, I suppose that our inquiry has reference to the soul. Cleinias, very true. Athenian, let us assume that there is a motion able to move other things, but not to move itself. That is one kind. And there is another kind which can move itself as well as other things, working in composition and decomposition by increase and diminu uh, diminish diminution, diminution <laughs> and generation and destruction. That is also one of the many kinds of motion. Granted, 
and Athenian. And we will assume that which moves that which moves other and is changed by other to be the ninth and that which changes itself and others is coincident with every action and every passion and is the true principle of change and motion in all that is that we shall be inclined to call the tenth by the way this is a terrible translation i would not recommend relying on this um the edition of Plato that I recommend is the Collected Dialogues edited by Edith Hamilton and uh, Huntington Cairns. That prose is much more reason, uh, readable. Yeah, this is just really bad. Sorry. <clears throat> Cleinias, granted. Athenian. And I will stop and explain anything that's really crucial to the argument anyway. And we will assume that which moves other and is changed by other to be the ninth and that which changes itself and others is coincident with every action and every passion is the true principle of change in motion in all that is, that we shall be inclined to call the tenth. Cleinias, certainly. Athenian. And which of these ten motions ought we to prefer as being the mightiest and most efficient? Cleinias, I must say that the motion which is able to move itself is 10,000 10, times superior to all the others. Athenian, very good. But may I make one or two corrections in what I have been saying? Cleinias, what are they? Athenian, when I spoke of the tenth sort of motion, that was not quite correct. Cleinias, what was the error? According to the true order, the tenth was really the first in generation and power and then follows the second, which was strangely enough termed by termed the ninth by us. What do you mean? I mean this, when one thing changes another, and that, uh, and that another, of such will there be any primary changing element? How can a thing which is moved by another ever be the beginning of change? Impossible. But when the self-moved changes other, and that again other, and thus thousands upon tens of thousands of bodies are set in motion, must not the beginning of all this motion be the change of the self-moving principle? Cleinias, very true, I quite agree. So you can't have a motion that's caused by another motion be the prime principle. The only kind of motion that is capable of being the start of the chain of all motion is that motion which is capable of moving itself and of moving other things. Cleinias, very true, and I quite agree. Athenian, or to put the question in another way, making, our, uh, making answer to ourselves, if, as most of these philosophers have the audacity to affirm, all things were at rest in one mass, which of the above-mentioned principles of motion would first spring up among them? So take reality, squeeze it into a singularity, What's the first kind of motion that's possible? Uh, clearly, the only one would be, as Kleinia says, the self-moving. For there could be no change in them arising out of any external cause. The change must first take place in themselves. Athenian. Then we must say that self-motion being the origin of all motions, and the first which arises among things at rest, as well as among things in motion, is the eldest and mightiest principle of change, and that which is changed by another and yet moves another is second. Cleinias, quite true. Athenian, at this stage of the argument, let, let us put a question. What question? If we were to see this power existing in any earthy, watery, or fiery substance, simple or compound, how should we describe it? Cleinias, you mean to ask whether we should call such a self-moving power life? Athenian, I do. Cleinias, certainly we should. Uh, think, you know, animal, anima, possessing a soul, uh, the power of self-motion. That's what the soul is seen to be in uh, the classical world. Athenian, and when we see soul in anything, was, must we not do the same? Must we not admit that this is life? Cleinias, we must. Athenian, and now I beseech you, reflect. You would admit that we have a threefold knowledge of things. Cleinias, what do you mean? Athenian, I mean that we know the essence and that we know the definition of the essence and the name. These are the three, and there are two questions which may be raised about anything. Cleinias, how to? 
Athenian. Sometimes a person may give the name and ask the definition, or he may give the definition and ask the name. I may illustrate what I mean in this way. Cleinias, how? Athenian, number like some other things is capable of being divided into equal parts. When thus divided, number is named even, and the definition of the name even is number divisible into two part, two equal parts. Cleinias, true. Athenian, I mean that when we are asked about the definition and give the name, or when we are asked about the name and give the definition, in either case, whether we give name or definition, we speak of the same thing, calling even the number which is divided into two equal parts. Quite true. And what is the definition of that which is named soul? Can we conceive of any other than that which has already been given, the motion which can move itself? You mean to say that the essence which is defined as the self-moved is the same with that which has the name soul? Yes. And if this is true, do we still maintain that there is anything wanting in the proof that the soul is the first origin and moving power of all that is, or has become, or will be, and their contraries, when she has been clearly shown to be the source of change and motion in all things? Certainly not. The soul as being the source of motion has been most satisfactorily shown to be the oldest of all things. Athenian, and is not that motion which is produced in another by reason of another, but never has any self-moving power at all, being in truth the change of an inanimate body, to be reckoned second, or by any lower number which you may prefer? Cleinias, exactly. Athenian, then we are right and speak the most perfect and absolute truth when we say that the soul is prior to the body, and that the body is second and comes afterwards, and is born to obey the soul, which is the ruler. And this is also kind of a common fallacy uh, throughout Plato's writings. I'm not sure if he was aware of this, but the anterior principle is always seen also to be uh, the kind of morally superior principle so if something causes another thing it must be better like if a father gives rise to a son the father must necessarily be better this is kind of a general general greek uh opinion it's to be seen in the iliad and the odyssey um other greek literature so yeah i'm not sure exactly let's let's think about this for a minute if if he's right and that the only kind of motion which can set about the motions of the world is that which moves itself and that which moves itself is that which has a soul um, does that then mean that the body is second and comes afterwards and is born to obey the soul which is the ruler well in this case you would be attributing a teleological function to the motion created by the unmoved mover. If that unmoved mover has a soul with all the properties of soul that we know of, like desire and having a wish and this kind of teleological function, then it would naturally create that motion which serves its its interest. And you know, you can see, you know, if if that unmoved mover is Schopenhauer's will, then all forms of the visible world will necessarily exist to satisfy some desire, to satisfy some will. They are born, in other words, to obey the soul. So, I, you know, like I said, you have to dig deep into Plato and compare him with the Hindu philosophy and compare him with, I think it's helpful to know Schopenhauer when you read Plato. Schopenhauer is easier to understand up front because Plato is cryptic. You, I mean, give it to a, you know, a high school student, tell him to read the Republic. They're going to get like maybe 10% of what's really being said. And a lot of it, because he includes obvious fallacies and he doesn't give like the true at length explanation behind a belief, um, it, you kind of just write it off. But yeah, there's a, Let's keep going. Cleinias, nothing can be more true. Athenian, do you remember our old admission that if the soul was prior to the body, the things of the soul were also prior to those of the body? 
Aquinas, certainly, Athenian, then characters and manners and wishes and reasonings and true opinions and reflections and recollections are, are prior to length and breadth and depth and strength of bodies if the soul is prior to the body. Yeah, so characters, manners, wishes, um, character, you know, Schopenhauer views the kind of innate character as a property of the will. The body is a manifestation of that will. Uh, the individuating principle underlying a personality is this character. And that, in Schopenhauer's opinion, is basically what Plato is getting at by an idea. So in the same sense that there's an idea of a triangle, not in time or space, but as a gesture of will, the will towards triangularity, there is a will towards you know my identity as Eric, right? I have my character that is basic in the will. So I can back that up. Manners, um, manners, I guess, like dispositions. Again, we're not looking at the actual Greek, so it's hard to tell. Wishes need to be prior to uh, bodily things. And if the will is prior to representations, that would follow. Reasonings. So you would need like that aspect of mind to be present, which is not necessarily a reasoning process, but like a rational nature to to reality must be present in order that irrational uh, matter can be present. And true opinions, so true opinions, truth and falsehood, this basically is saying like the metalogical laws have to apply as well as other principles of reasoning in order that we can have, you know, material non-thinking things and reflections and recollections so memory has to also be prior to length and breadth and depth and strength. Um, so it just basically he's prioritizing all mental things over all bodily things, which has to do also with his ordering of the elements of the soul. We should put the rational soul ahead of the thumos and the appetite. Um, so part of this, like, it, it, you'd have to basically get into a deeper analysis of, of, uh, kind of the Hindu ideas underlying it to make it valid. Uh, like I said, you can't just take it at face value and think that's the extent of, of the position. Um, but anyway, Clinius, to be sure, Athenian, in the next place, we must not of necessity admit uh, that the soul is the cause of good and evil, base and honorable, just and unjust, and of all other opposites, if we suppose her to be the cause of all things. Cleinias, we must, Athenian, and as the soul orders and inhabits all things that move, however moving, must we not say that she orders also the heavens? Cleinias, of course. Athenian, one soul or more? More than one, I will answer for you. At any rate, we must not suppose that there are less than two, one the author of good and the other of evil. Cleinias, very true. Athenian, yes, very true. The soul then directs all things in heaven and earth and sea by her movements, and these are described by the terms will, consideration, attention, deliberation, opinion, true and false, joy and sorrow, confidence, fear, hatred, love, and other primary motions akin to these, which again receive the secondary motions of corporeal substance and guide all things to growth and decay to composition and decomposition, to the qualities which accompany them, such as heat and cold and heaviness, lightness, hardness and softness, blackness and whiteness, bitterness and sweetness, and all those other qualities which the soul uses, herself a goddess, when truly receiving the divine mind, she disciplines all things rightly to their happiness, but when she is companion of folly, she does the very contrary of all this. Shall we assume so much, or do we still entertain doubts? Clinius, there is no room at all for doubt. Clinius, or rather Athenian. Shall we say then that it is the soul which controls heaven and earth and the whole world, that it is a principle of wisdom and virtue, or a principle which has neither wisdom nor virtue? Uh, suppose that we make answer as follows. Clinius, how would you answer? Athenian, if, my friend, we say that the whole path and movement of heaven and of all that is therein, is by nature akin to the movement and revolution and calculation of mind, and proceeds by kindred laws, then, as is plain, we must say that the best soul takes care of the world and guides it along the good path. True. 
But if the world moves wildly and irregularly, then the evil soul guides it. True again. Of what nature is the movement of mind? To this question, it is not easy to give an intelligent answer. Therefore, I ought to assist you in framing one. Very good. Then let us not answer as if we were looking straight at the sun, making ourselves dark, uh, ourselves darkness at midday i mean as if we were under the impression that we could see with mortal eyes or know adequately the nature of mind it will be safer to look at the image only what do you mean let us select of the ten motions the one which mind chiefly resembles this i will bring to your recollection will and will then make the answer on behalf uh, of us all Clinius. that will be excellent you will surely remember our saying that all things were either at rest or in motion. I do. And that of things in motion, some were moving in one place and others in more than one. Yes. Of these two kinds of motion, that which moves in one place and must move about a center like globes made in a lathe and is most entirely akin and similar to the circular movement of mind. What do you mean? In saying that both mind and motion, which is in one place uh, in the same and like manner, move in the same and like manner, and in and about the same, and in relation to the same, and according to one proportion and, up and order, and are like the motion of a globe, we invent a fair image, which does no discredit to our ingenuity. Okay, so we have to distinguish then between soul, which is the unmoved mover, that which has the power of self-motion, and the mind which is akin to the motion of a an orbit or a rotation because it moves about a firm center it moves about one thing and this is like thinking about how he engages in discourse they're they're like honing in on one topic and the way of revolving around it is ordered um obviously analogy is taken very seriously by plato and you would want to look at uh, a neoplatonic like proclus to get into a deeper analysis of the nature of analogy and um, it kind of has its own logical structure like the structure of similes um, proclus will go into and so some of this is obviously incipient in in plato's thinking as well um, but i can't i can't like do justice to plato's whole position the best i can do is give analogies to other systems which kind of give credence to what Plato goes through in the dialogues. Um, Cleinias, it does us great credit. Um, okay. Athenian, and the motion of the other sort, which is not after the same manner, nor in the same manner, nor about the same, nor in relation to the same, nor in one place, nor in order, nor anything... Uh, or according to any rule or proportion, may be said to be akin to senselessness and folly. Cleinias, that is most true. So chaotic motion is senseless. A rational orbit is the work of a mind. Then after what has been said, there is no difficulty in distinctly saying that since soul carries all things round, either the best soul or the contrary must of necessity carry round and order and arrange the revolution of the heaven. Clinius. And judging from what has been said, stranger, there would be impiety in asserting that any but the most perfect soul or souls carries round the heavens. Athenian, you have understood my meaning right well, Clinius. And now let me ask you another question. What are you going to ask? If the soul carries round the sun and moon and the other stars, does she not carry round each individual of them? Certainly. Then of one of them let us speak, and the same argument will apply to all. Which will you do? Uh, which will you take? Everyone sees the body of the sun, but no one sees his soul, nor the soul of any other body, living or dead. And yet there is great reason to believe that this nature, unperceived by any of our senses, is circumfused around them all, but is perceived by mind, and therefore by mind and reflection only. Let us apprehend the following point: What is it? If the soul carries round the sun. We shall not be far wrong in supposing one of three alternatives. What are they? Either the soul, which moves the sun this way and that, resides within the circular invisible body, like the soul which carries us about every way, or the soul provides herself with an external body of fire or air, as some affirm, and violently propels body by body, 
Or thirdly, she is without such a body, but guides the sun by some extraordinary and wonderful power. Yes, certainly, the soul can only order all things in one of these three ways. And this soul of the sun, which is therefore better than the sun, whether uh, taking the sun about in a chariot to give light to men, or acting from without, or in whatever way, ought by every man to be deemed a god. <clears throat> Cleinias. Yes, by every man who has the least particle of sense. Athenian and of the stars too, and of the moon, and of the years, and months, and seasons, must we not say in like manner, that since our soul, or souls, having every sort of excellence, are the causes of all of them, those souls are gods, whether they are living being, beings, and reside in bodies, and in this way order the whole heaven, or whatever may be uh, the place and mode of their existence, and will any one who admits all this venture to deny that all things are full of gods. So he's quoting Thales there. All right, I think we we can basically leave it here. <clears throat> Plato was not a, a real polytheist. He argues for monotheism as well. I think uh, the hidden doctrine is monism rather than classical mon uh, monotheism. When he says that all things are full of gods, he is arguing that there must be some kind of rational and willful principle anterior to the physical manifestations of the rationally ordered bodies of the heavens. And so that prior principle of the existence of the sun, you can look at it like a formal principle as well. Like there, there's a form of the sun, a form of solarity, a form of the winter, a form of you know the seasons that has a soulful existence and not a material existence first. And this, uh, I would have to argue for, you know, the priority of will over representation or the, the need for that to be the ultimate like cause underlying material things that can be found in Schopenhauer. And I'm not going to fully flesh this argument out. You have a whole week to be thinking about it um, for yourselves and we can have a discussion on this. And for those who show up next week, I will, uh, you know, give my interpretation more fully. We'll probably talk about it for longer than this video. Um, but yeah, he he is arguing for the existence of multiple gods. He he's basically using this roundabout uh, argument from the priority of soul, which refers to his true doctrines to justify. Uh, so he's hinting towards his true philosophy, but using that some some arguments from from it to justify the existence of the ordinary gods of Greek culture that the laws mandate. So he's arguing for the existence that you know of Apollo in the sun, or like related to the sun, and he's kind of leaving it open. Like, is there a soul within the sun, or is there some kind of you know we can't quite understand the nature of the mind underlying the sun. Uh, but there must necessarily be one. Again, because there has to be uh, a self-moving principle underlying uh, body. It applies to the whole and therefore to all parts. So you could also say this, like, is he committing a kind of fallacy of, of composition there where he's saying you need a kind of world soul in, in order to account for the motions that we observe, there has to be, and soul, remember, is just the capacity for self-motion, <clears throat> where the motion ultimately starts. So he's arguing for a, wo a world soul, and therefore, also by extension, all things in the world must have soul, underlying them as their basis. Um, I would, I mean, I can see how I would interpret that in my system to be basically true. Um, and the, the passage of time and physical properties only happen from the perspective of some world line of an observer. Um, there's like an observer dependence in physical systems in my system. And again, I'll, I'll explain that uh, later on. But to really interpret Plato's argument and see why I would agree with it would take, uh, I would have to explain my whole system as well. Um, so this it's cryptic, but the basic argument, just to reiterate before we end, is that there are different types of motion. The motion, the only kind of motion that could be a candidate for starting other kinds of motion 
ultimately governing other kinds would be that which is capable of moving itself. And that which is capable of moving itself is the definition of soul. And so the kind of motion that has the ability to be the prime mover is itself soul. Uh, soul has to be the first principle. All things in the world that obey rational law obey ultimately some kind of soul property. Uh, there's a soul underlying them. Now you could say it's monotheistically one world soul, or you could kind of divide it up and say there is a soul aspect of sun of the sun's motion or of any any individual thing. Its motion is governed by some rational principle that's separable into its the cause. It's the soul that is its cause, and this is how he argues for the existence of the specific deities in the Greek pantheon. It's a method of interpreting with the existence of the the uh, the Greek deities, but again. You can't take what he's saying for granted, and it would, I think, do you well to to really reflect on what's being said here. Maybe read the whole book, uh, book ten, that is, um, and you know, also reflect on the notion that most mathematicians today and a, a large proportion of physicists are uh, Platonic realists, and this this philosophy is something to wrap your mind around. So thank you for listening. Make sure to vote in the poll for next week, what topic we should address. And also uh, show up Saturday morning, 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time next week. And uh, we'll discuss this topic. Thank you for listening.